Hello and welcome to this webinar organised by SESTA. Our topic today is Data for Research into Ageing. Um, I'm Jen Buckley and I work for the UK Data Service. And I'll be joined by Stefan Gruber, who works on managing the shared database, Siobhan Leahy from the Irish Longitudinal Study of Ageing, and Tristan Phillips, manager of Gateway to Global Ageing Data, uh, which is based at the University of Southern California. Okay, and here is an overview of the webinar. So I'm going to start with a, a very brief bit of background information about SESTA and social science data services, and a very quick overview of some of the available data. We'll then move on to the main part of the webinar. So first, we, um, Stefan will discuss SHARE, the survey of health, ageing and retirement in Europe. We'll then have Siobhan discussing the Irish Longitudinal Study of Ageing and Tristan to talk about Gateway to Global Ageing data. Um, there will be an opportunity to ask questions. Um, you can ask questions by typing them into a questions box on the webinar control panel. This is usually to the right of the screen. Um, if you can't see it, you may need to maximize the control panel by clicking on a red box with an arrow. Um, so feel free to type questions at any point, but we'll pick them all up and answer them at the end. Um, we will provide a copy of the slides after the webinar and also add a recording of the webinar to the SESTA website. So SESTA is a consortium of European social science data archives and it aims to provide the research infrastructure to enable the research community to conduct high quality research. And key tasks underlying this vision include developing standards and best practices around the management and archiving of social science data and facilitating research access to important resources. Uh, national data services are the core operational bodies in SESTA. Um, national data services provide access to extensive collections of data and you may be familiar with the service in your country or some of the larger services such as GASIS or the UK Data Service. Uh, all national data services have websites with online catalogues for searching and browsing. On the screen is the catalogue for the Swedish National Data Service. Um, these catalogues will allow you to search using terms such as ageing or to search for particular studies and there are usually ways to refine and sort your search. So there are many national data services in Europe and um, this image comes from the SESTA website where you can find information and links to all the national data services. So there's a wealth of data within Europe relating to ageing and its effects on individuals and society. Um, re so research infrastructures such as national data services provide access to uh, data collections from large-scale projects alongside outputs from smaller research teams and individual researchers. Uh, there are major studies focused on ageing and related topics including longitudinal studies, uh, studies collecting biomarkers and harmonisation across key studies and dedicated cross-national projects also facilitate comparative research. Um, to help you navigate uh, all the data that's available, we've put together a short information sheet. Uh, the information sheet summarises major data resources, giving details about how to find and access them. Um, the information sheet will be available as a handout from the webinar, and we'll also make it available on the SESDA website. Just in summary, so some of the most significant studies for ageing research belong to a family of surveys focused on health, ageing and retirement. And these are going to be the focus of the presentations that follow. And there are also other ageing focused data resources in Europe, such as the Norwegian study on life course ageing and generation. And in Sweden, the national e-infrastructure for ageing research. And many of the cross-national studies are also useful for research into ageing. Uh, for instance, the Generations and Gender Programme looks at family relationships across both the generations and genders. Uh, national data services provide access to extensive collections, so examples that can be relevant include the general social surveys, many of which include questions on topics such as health and retirement alongside other social topics. Longitudinal studies, which allow analysis of change at the individual level, uh, include both household panel studies and cohort studies. And several European national data services also give access to qualitative data, such as in-depth interview, transcripts, field notes, and answers to open-ended questions. If wanting to know more about national data services, we also have a guide that introduces how to find and access data from national data services. 
and it includes a number of key questions and summary information about individual data services. So at this point, um, I'll pass you over to Stefan, um, who will discuss um, the SHARE project with us. Yes, um, I'm talking about um, the SHARE study, um, uh, the survey of health, aging and retirement in Europe. And yeah, first of all, um, why why did, was SHARE started? Um, I think we all know that population aging is one of the main challenges um, of the future. Um, here on the right hand side you can see the age structure of the EU15 and its de de development until the year 2050 and you can see a clear shift um, towards the older age cohorts. Um, although this is known for quite a while there was uh, insufficient uh, information to understand well first of all the living conditions um, of elder people and what are they influenced by and also how state policies influence these living conditions of elderly people. And this is why, why SHARE was started uh, in 2004. Um, we explore the European Natural Laboratory. Um, what do I mean by that? Um, we have up to now 21 countries in SHARE and of course all these countries are differently affected by population aging and they also have different political and cultural contexts. So this is why I talk about Europe as a natural laboratory. And the final objective of SHARE is to provide policymakers with re reliable information um, and finally turn the challenges of population aging into opportunities. Um, in SHARE we have three main dimensions. Um, in the focus. The first one is the, are the economic living conditions of, of our respondents. Um, second one is health, um, not just physical health but also mental health, disability, psychological health. Health care is also a very important part um, of this dimension. And the third one is the social network um, of our respondents. Of course, these three dimensions are not independent from each other. They, of course, influence each other and inter are interconnected. Furthermore, they are also influenced by the political and cultural context. And, of course, they are not static but dynamic. Um, and that's why we need longitudinal information to see how the living conditions of elderly people change. So that's actually the, the, the main principles of SHARE. Um, we have, in SHARE we have, we have we are a longitudinal survey, so um, we have a panel structure with repeated observations, usually every two years. So far um, we released six waves um, of SHARE with around 120 individuals and around 300,000 interviews. In SHARE we have 20 European countries plus Israel and we conduct ex-ante harmonized computer assisted personal interviews. On this slide um, you can see an overview um, of the different data collection waves. So we started in wave 1 in the year 2004 with 12 countries. And then you can see that with each wave um, some new countries uh, join share. Um, let me perhaps emphasize on, the, on this slide um, two things. One thing is wave three, which is a special wave because it's not, we did not collect usual panel information in this wave, but um, retrospective life history data. I will talk about that later on a little bit. And the other thing I want to point to on this slide is wave 7, which is in the field at the moment. And as you can see, we will have a lot of new countries um, joining SHARE. All in all, we will be 28 countries um, in wave 7. And this is also very uh, interesting content that we're collecting in wave 7 because we do combine both questions, panel questions and um, retrospective life histories in this wave. Um, here you see an overview about the 30 interview modules that we have. So the share interview and the questionnaire is structured in different modules or contents. 
Um, I don't want to go through all um, all the different modules right now. Just um, the important takeaway point here is that not every module is part of every wave. Here, uh, red marked, you can see, for example, that the social network module um, was part in wave four, and then asked again in wave six. So. When you're interested in doing research with shared data, always keep that in mind that interview, uh, interview modules might not be part of every wave. Another um, important um, thing I want to point you at is that not every module is answered by each respondent. So we do this to save interview time. Um, and here I show you, for example, the household respondent, what we call the household respondent. Um, so he or she answers questions on housing, household income, and household consumption on behalf of the other household members. And when you have a look at the data later on, of course, this will have the consequence that for respondents who live in a household and are not household respondents, they, of course, have missing information. So here the important thing is that you always should check the questionnaire routing and um, should also keep in mind that we have these special respondents in SHARE. Additionally to our usual um, interview modules, we also offer 17 generated variable modules. Um, here we, for example, um, help the user um, by providing um, uh, scales or, or different measures like the, the BMI, the body mass index. So we do a lot of work um, for the users here. And also very important are the, the weights, which you will find as generated variable modules. We offer both longitudinal and cross-sectional weights. And we also have uh, imputations uh, as a generated variable. Okay, how, how are data documented? Um, if you visit our website, you will see a tab on the left-hand side which um, says data documentation. And there you will find a table with all the documentation files that you as a user need um, when you start working with the shared data. Um, for the beginning, the most important documentation files are the release guides. We have two release guides, one for the regular panel waves of SHARE, wave one, two, four, five, and six, and one additional release guide for, for the SHARE life, for the retrospective life histories. And additionally, very important are, of course, the questionnaires, because there you can see exactly the question wording, and you also can see the routing, which um, is the reason for, for the missing values, for most of the missing values that you will find in the data. Um, apart from our regular um, shared data, we also um, provide some so-called special data sets. Here uh, I want to present mainly three um, data sets. Um, the first one is Share Life, the third wave of data collection. Um, I also want to shortly talk about the Job Episodes panel and Easy Share. So, share life. Um, as I said before, this is the third wave of data collection, and here you will find retrospective life history data on health, employment, the financial situation, partner history, housing, and you also will find um, some childhood information in this data. Um, and we collect we collect this data uh, with a so-called life history calendar. So. The basic principle here is, you can see that uh, on this slide now, that we firstly ask the most important life events. Um, here in this example, you can see that um, the respondent had two children, and they were born in 1975 and 1978. And then you can use these life events like birth, um, of children and always refer to these live events, which makes it easier for the respondents to remember when certain things happened in their life. Another special data set is the job episodes panel. And this data set is based on the share life, da share life data. 
it has a focus on the top history of the respondents, but also contains information on migration and family biography. And very interesting in this data set is that it also contains context data um, on, for example, the statutory retirement age, early retirement age, but also con uh, pension contributions and minimum and maximum pension benefits for each country and for the whole life course of our respondents. So this, this, is, this makes it really interesting and, and rich uh, data set. And the last special data set um, I want to show you is um, EasyShare. Here on this screen you see um, all the different modules that we provide for our users with the regular share data. And of course, when you start working with the data set, this is perhaps a little complicated. So what we did was we just generated the easy share data set. So you have one single data file and you can start working with the share data straight away. Um, the intention of EasyShare is yes, to make an easy entrance um, for the users, but we also use this data set as student, student training and we also offer that to other universities to use um, EasyShare as a student training data set. EasyShare has the same number of observations as the main release of Share, um, but it is restricted to some central variables. In EasyShare, we have a simply simplified data structure, um, and well, you can download EasyShare and directly start with your analysis without any complicated uh, data preparation procedures. Um, perhaps interesting for you might also be that the release guide also includes exemplary analysis, and very useful. Um, for the share users is that we also provide the stata code for you that generates easy share and this stata code can be used as an example for the generation of your own share panel data set so I think as a starting point easy share is a very good a very good data set and very helpful for for users okay and last but not least some few words about the data access um, we don't have a lot of requirements. The only requirement you have to fulfill is that you have a scientific affiliation and that you use our data only for scientific purposes. Um, what you need to do is you need to sign a user statement that you can download from the SHARE website. And um, we also provide only individual access. So if you work in a, in a well, in a research group, um, you should not distribute the, the share data to, to the other members of your group. Um, please make sure that everyone who uses the share data also is a registered share user. Yeah, and if you're interested in our newsletter, we have uh, on the left hand, on the bottom, you can see our email address, and there you can also ask user questions. Now I will pass you over to Siobhan. Thanks, Jen. Um, my name is Siobhan and I'm a research fellow with the Irish Longitudinal Study on Aging. So I'm going to present a little bit about the data structure that we use in TILDA and the accessibility of the data um, on public platforms. Um, so we're quite similar to SHARE, so a lot of what Stefan covered actually applies to TILDA as well. We're part of the HRS, Health and Retirement Study family of aging studies worldwide, which includes SHARE. So actually a lot of our questions um, will be either very similar to or identical to many of the questions uh, used, included in SHARE and other studies. So we're highly comparable. Um, TILDA began a little bit later than SHARE. And so it's a nationally representative study of the Republic of Ireland. We don't include the Northern Counties. Our sampling is based on the Irish Geo Directory, which is basically a list of all eligible addresses in the Republic of Ireland. Uh, we conducted a three-stage approach, and this all took place in advance of the first wave of data collection in TILDA, back around 2008-2009. Uh, so the first step was to identify a, in, uh, a specific population sampling units, of which there were 3,155. Uh, in the country. We then chose 640 of these clusters based mainly on two factors. Firstly, that it would get a 
geographical spread wide enough to represent all corners of the country and also that it adequately uh, represented the different socioeconomic strata within the population as well. So from these 640 clusters, 40 addresses were randomly selected within each cluster. Uh, so this resulted in over 25,000 addresses being generated and contacted by social interviewers. And of the uh, 25,600 houses, um, not every house had an eligible respondent over the age of 50, but of the houses that did have eligible respondents, we received a 62% response rate to the study. And this resulted in a sample that we've won of 8,500 community dwelling older adults. So we have three forms of data collection in TILDA, which makes us a little bit different to some of the other aging studies. So we begin our process with a CAPI interview, similar to SHARE, uh, where interviewers go into the home and uh, complete a detailed interview with the respondent. This can take about one and a half hours, um, roughly, maybe a little longer for more elderly people. And it includes all of the domains, really, that uh, Stefan already covered in terms of social, economic, and health circumstances. Once a respondent has completed the copy, there is also a self-completion questionnaire left with them uh, with a stamped addressed envelope, which they can post back to us later on. And the purpose of the self-completion questionnaire is to cover some of the more sensitive material, maybe around relationships, etc., that people might not be as comfortable answering in person to an interviewer. So it's at the discretion of the respondent whether they want to complete this questionnaire. They're encouraged to do so and then post it back to us. Everybody who completes an interview is offered the opportunity to do a health assessment. And this is uh, probably the largest and most unique component of TILDA in that it's quite a detailed health assessment. And it takes place either in a dedicated health centre or in the respondent's own home if they don't wish to travel. It can take up to three hours to complete in the health centre, but it covers a huge range of, uh, of tests, including some very advanced cardiovascular, vision, gait and cognitive aspects as well. Uh, so the design of TILDA is similar to SHARE in that we complete waves approximately every two years. To date we have completed four waves and are planning to go into the field with wave five at the start of 2018. Um, so if you look at the graphic on screen, you can see in wave one, which was collected from late 2009 to early 2011, uh, this included the CAPI, the SEQ and the health assessment. And this was similar to wave three. So the current model is that every second wave is a health wave where we collect the most detailed information. And the intervening waves then are restricted just to CAPI and self-completion questionnaire. So this is a summary of the response rates to date in TILDA. If you look at the second column, wave one, of the 8,500 people who completed a CAPI at wave one, 85% of this sample also completed an SEQ and 72% attended a health assessment. And roughly 80% of those who attended the health assessment did so at the health centre and the remainder had an assessment in their home, which was a modified assessment and didn't contain all of the tests. In wave two then, we had a 90% follow-up rate and again, 85% of people completed the SEQ. Similarly, at wave three and four, we had an overall response rate of around 85%, and with 85% of this sample then completing an SCQ. And this represents a very good retention rate in comparison to other studies, and it's something that we work very hard on maintaining across the waves. As well as the, all, all of the tilted data is housed here in Trinity College, Dublin and that is the full unrestricted data set with all of the information collected on it. We also have publicly accessible data which is available on the Irish Social Science Data Archive which is housed in UCD in Dublin and also at the University of Michigan and our harmonised data sets are available on the Gateway to Global Aging which Justin will talk about later. Um, currently Waves 1 and Wave 2 are available for use by other scientists and 
And similar to SHARE, we do look for an affiliation to an academic institute before releasing data. And we do it on the understanding that it's not for commercial use. Currently, Waves 1 and Waves 2 are available, and Wave 3 will be coming online in the very near future. One issue which makes the job of making our data publicly accessible is weighing up uh, our duties in terms of data protection versus data access. And essentially, because we're highly representative of the overall Irish population, we are very concerned um, and very cautious not to release any data which may be identifiable. Of the the, the original sample of eight and a half thousand adults that were sampled in Tilda represents so one adult represents about one adult included in Tilda represents approximately one hundred and forty adults in the population in Ireland. So it is very representative and we are conscious that it may be easy to identify people if we release huge swathes of data over time. And so we always weigh up um, the benefits of having publicly accessible data for high quality research versus the duty to our participants of protecting their anonymity. So conscious of this, we have another, a number of anonymization techniques in collaboration with the Irish Central Statistics Office to do everything we can to avoid possible identification of individuals. So the first thing we always do is remove highly sensitive information, for example, names and addresses. We also remove any potentially identifiable information. Um, this is data which an individual may be identified when used in combination with other information about the individual. So there's a number of things we do to uh, avoid this. So we often group variables together. So for example, with the Wave 2 release, um, for medical conditions, rather than putting in the individual conditions, we group them together uh, by using the ICD-10 codes. Um, because, for example, if you had data from Wave 1 and Wave 2 where you knew somebody was 57 years old, female, had six children, and subsequently developed a specific disease between the waves, then that person could be highly identifiable. So we've done, we, we've rigorously went through the data and try to identify any possible breaches, and then use techniques such as grouping, top and bottom coding, generating new variables, or dropping uh, anything where we feel people might be identifiable. So the questionnaire domains that we include in TILDA mirror those of SHARE. The three main domains are health, social, and economic. And in general, in order to be comparable to the other studies, we use scales and standardized measures where possible. And within the questionnaire, which is accessible online, you can see in any cases where our questions are similar to that of ELSA, SHARE, or the HRS, it's actually documented within the questionnaire. Um, this screen looks a lot like something that Stefan presented. So it's a list of all the modules within the CAPI questionnaire in TILDA. And as you can see, I'm not, I'm not interested in going through each domain or each module, but three domains are covered. And each module has a module code. For example, the cover screen has code of CS, and PH relates to physical health and cognitive function, which I'll get onto in a minute as an example. So our naming conventions for the variables that you'll see in the TILDA data set are based on the collection method used, the section of the questionnaire that the variable comes from, and the question number. And the labels used within the data set are usually shortened versions of the questions that appear in the original questionnaire. Uh, so this is an example of how we name variables. So this particular variable comes from the CAPI. And the question that was asked with the respondent was, do you usually wear glasses or contact lenses? And the number of the question in, uh, of, of this in the questionnaire is PH101. So the PH is what we call the section identifier. So this tells us that this comes from the PH, or physical health section. And 101 is the question number within the physical health section. And the variable then within the data set is uh, just identical to the question. And it can be asked in various forms depending on the type of interview the person is undertaking. This uh, example is slightly different in that the previous screen related to questions where there is one possible answer. However, a number of our uh, 
questions within the copy are multiple choice um, possible answers. So for example, uh, question PH201 is the question, has a doctor ever told you that you have any of these conditions? And it's a list of about 20 medical conditions where respondents are free to endorse as many of the questions as they wish or as applies to them. So in this case, PH again is the section identifier, 201 is the question number, and underscore 05 identifies the option or the loop within that question. So somebody could potentially have endorsed PH201 underscore 05 in addition to 201 underscore 03 or underscore 04. And again, the variable is identical to the question. Um, from the self-completion questionnaire, it's very similar again. This time the prefix is always SCQ in capital letters, which indicates that this particular variable comes from the SCQ rather than the copy. Um, and the question identifier then is cage one. And again, the label is cut down on drinking. Similar to the share uh, model, we also have an extensive number of derived variables. So this is where we have done significant cleaning to the raw data from TILDA. And we use it usually when we are using a number of questions to, uh, to come up with a scale. So a lot of the mental health uh, variables in TILDA will com comprise a scale. And we do the derivation of that. So we will use the individual items to come up with the final scale. And again, you can identify these in the data set. The difference between derived variables and raw data is that the prefix for the derived variables will always be in capital letters. So for example, for chronic diseases, uh, the prefix will be CHR in capital letters. If we look at here, you can see that CHR chronic refers to the number of chronic diseases. Uh, COG refers to cognitive tests, so COG MMSE is the fully scored mini mental state exam. Uh, MD polypharmacy, uh, MD prefix refers to medications, so this variable takes all of the individual medications that we collect and ascertains whether somebody is taking five or more medications. And then MH has a is the derived variable which gives the total score for the hospital anxiety and depression scale. And throughout the data set, despite the different techniques we use and the different types of questions, we try to use standard response options where possible. So this is outside of the standard yes, no answers or questions where you might have options one to four. And generally, they're used for questions where there is multiple responses. So for example, if somebody doesn't in, is given a list of conditions and doesn't endorse any of them, they have the option to say other, which is scored a 95, none or none of the above, which is a 96, and specific to the cognitive tests, a 97 means they're unable to carry out the tasks. For every single question in the data set, we have a don't know or refused option. And these are coded uh, variously as 98 minus 98 underscore 98 for don't know, or 99 minus 99 underscore 99 for refused. And minus ones you'll always see quite commonly in the data set. And these are for to identify people who haven't responded to a question on the basis that they weren't routed to it, not because they refused to answer the question. So if you ask, access the data through ISDA or through the University of Michigan, we provide all the supporting documentation necessary uh, to assist with your analysis. So there's a design report which describes the overall uh, sampling and planning of TILDA from the outset. The questionnaire for each wave is available. So this includes the entirety of the questions, the routing instructions, and then some nuances in question wording, which depend on the type of interview you're getting, whether it's your first time in the study, whether you're a repeat interviewee, or whether somebody is completing a proxy interview on your behalf. There's also release guides which go along with each version of the data set, and these are updated every time we update the data set. There's a derived variables codebook, which is very instructive and hugely useful. 
and we also document the anonymization actions that we take. In addition, at each wave we produce a main findings report uh, which covers some of the data collected specific to that wave. That's it in terms of TILDA, but I'm happy to answer any questions that anybody has. Great, thank you very much, Vaughan. Um, so we'll move pr promptly on to um, Dresden um, to hear about Gateway to Global Aging Data. Uh, thank you, and, and thank you, um, <clears throat> Siobhan and Stefan, for making my job much easier by introducing um, these two studies. And these two studies, as Siobhan mentioned, are part of um, a network of global aging studies um, conducted around the world in similar ways. Uh, and I'll just briefly overview what are all the studies that are included in the um, in, in addition to uh, SHARE and TILDA. So that includes the HRS in the U.S. Um, in Mexico, there's the MHAS. In England, there is ELSA, of course, SHARE. Uh, in Korea, there's a study called CLOSA. There's also a study in Indonesia called the IFLS. In Japan, there's a study called JSTAR. There's a multi-country study uh, called SAGE, conducted by the World Health Organization. Of course, TILDA. There's also a Costa Rican study called Corellis. Uh, in China, they have the Charles study. And um, in India, um, <clears throat> we're currently in the field for the longitudinal aging study in India or LASI. Uh, so as you can imagine, all of these studies um, are very complicated. Uh, they have lots of questions, lots of different modules. And so we designed a central resource um, for people to access these. Um, all of these studies have um, some similar key innovations. Uh, that includes that they're multidisciplinary in the subject matter. So as we've seen, they have questions about um, demographics, health, economics. And there's also usually enhanced quality economic data. So all of these studies um, <clears throat> generally use unfolding bracket questions um, uh, to be able to replace missingness for economic questions, which sometimes occur um, in survey data. And then most of the studies provide imputations, um, as Stefan mentioned, for SHARE uh, to be able to fill in that missing data. And they also integrate biomarkers into social surveys. Um, so these include something like uh, blood pressure, also blood specimens, um, or health measures, um, as, uh, as TILDA has some great health measures. They all share uh, core content areas, uh, which are usually divided into survey modules. So demographic, health, health services, work and employment, economic status, and family structure and social network. So we developed uh, the gateway, uh, the gateway to global aging data to be a central place to access um, all of these data sets um, uh, and to find information about all these data sets. Um, the gateway is available at uh, www.g2aging.org. Uh, the gateway includes uh, a library of all survey questionnaires, uh, flow charts, which illustrate a questionnaire skip pattern. We built a search engine to locate specific survey items. We have statistics, uh, which show interactive uh, in graphs and tables, documentation of cross-study comparability. Uh, we have a publication search, uh, so you can find other research that's been done um, <clears throat> using these data sets. Uh, and we've uh, built harmonized data and these harmonized data sets are a bit like EasyShare that Stefan mentioned um, in that they're not uh, the entirety of any of the surveys, um, but they're kind of selected measures in the surveys which are created to be comparable between different surveys and between different uh, waves of that same survey. So it's a subset um, of, uh, all the, of all the survey data which is most frequently used and most uh, easily harmonizable between different surveys. Um, so the Gateway to Global Aging Data, as I mentioned, is available at g2aging.org. Uh, you can see here on our first uh, tab, we have surveys. You can see all the surveys, as I mentioned, which are included in this. So you'll notice that the HRS here in the United States started in 1992, uh, while SHARE, as Stefan mentioned, started in 2004. That includes Europe and Israel. Uh, for any of these surveys, we can go into the survey itself. So if we go into share wave one, uh, we see the different modules of share. And then for instance, if we went into a module called behavioral risk, we can see the questions that are asked in share. And you can see these in a flow chart uh, or as a list of items. <clears throat> um, so we can see the first question is this ever smoked daily question. So the question in share is the following questions are about smoking, drinking, alcoholic beverages. 
Have you ever smoked cigarettes, cigars, or cigarillos, or a pipe for a period of at least one year? We let you know that the answer choices are yes and no. Uh, this variable is used in a harmonized survey, so it's included in the harmonized um, share. Um, <clears throat> and then we also list concurrent items. So what is this item that was asked in other waves of share, including to, uh, other than 2004? Uh, so survey questionnaires include uh, the location of all survey items inside the interview, as we saw, uh, how the question was asked and to whom. So again, as Stefan mentioned, it's really important to know that not all questions are asked to all people who are interviewed. So for instance, uh, questions about uh, the household itself are often just asked to one, in, one uh, person in the household. We include links to microdata variables and how those values are formatted. Uh, and we've assigned some research topics, keywords, and domains for easier searching, and we'll see that. You can also see that in addition to these kind of core interview or CAPI interviews, we also have uh, all the interviews indexed for the self-completion, the life history interviews, the health assessments, and exit interviews. Uh, and then we have flowcharts. Um, and if you're new to survey data, understanding the survey logic or survey skip pattern is really important to understand. Um, so here in SHARE, uh, 2006 SHARE, we see this first question of um, the following questions are about smoking, as we saw before. Have you ever smoked uh, for a period of at least one year? And if you answer yes, then you could ask the question, do you smoke at the present time? Um, so for you as a researcher, if you want to make um, a variable which captures smoking at the present time, you need to account for both the question smoking at the present time and you need to account for the ever smoked daily question um, to be able to kind of complete a measure. So these, skip, uh, these flow charts are a helpful way to visualize the survey skip pattern and let you know all the questions that you need uh, to take into account for create full measures. We also built the concordance and this is our search. So users can identify comparable survey measures between retirement surveys using a keyword search, top-level research domains for all HRS sister studies, finer research topics for harmonized studies. This allows users to compare measures between multiple waves of one study in the same uh, year in multiple studies. Um, so for instance, if we go back to our website, we can click on the concordance tab, and we could search for something like glasses, um, <clears throat> uh, as we saw, and we could search for tilde. You can see we have the waves of tilde available here. Let's say we search in 2010. Uh, and once we search, we can see we'll get all these questions in tilde that are related to glasses. And you can see the first one uh, is that one that Siobhan mentioned, which is PH101. So you can do this for any of the surveys, as many at a time or as many years at a time, um, as is helpful for your research. Uh, we also, for uh, some of these um, <clears throat> harmonized data sets, you can also select, for instance, uh, the harmonized share in 2004, and you could select um, uh, the birth date variables or the education variables um, and search just for those uh, and we'll give you those variables um, <clears throat> without kind of the keyword searching also. We've included a lot of documentation. As you can imagine, all of these surveys can be quite different uh, between different waves of each individual survey and then between different surveys. So we built the main specific comparison tables for a number of topics. I won't read them all. And we've also uh, created some domain-specific user guides. And these user guides are uh, quite detailed um, uh, accounts of all the questions which are asked for a particular topic, uh, how they're asked in different surveys, uh, how people deal with their differences, and are a really great starting point. Um, all of the documentation is available um, on the gateway, on this doc documentation tab at the top right here. Um, <clears throat> you can see here these are the um, summary tables, so, for instance, a cognition summary table would let you know uh, for an immediate word recall test how many words were used in that test in different studies. Um, and then below these cognition tables, you can find links to uh, our working paper series, which again are quite long, but they're very detailed. We built interactive graphs and charts as we wanted to give users a way to be able to uh, work with the data a little bit. Um, <clears throat> before downloading it and thinking about things like weighting data and accounting for complex survey design. Um, so for instance, uh, here you can see a graph for total family income. This is using ELSA data, so it represents England. Uh, and here we look over three age groups. Uh, you can see the distribution of wealth is different for these three age groups. And as you would expect, as people move 
you know, more earnings-based um, uh, income, uh, so maybe a more pension-based income or savings-based income. Um, here's an example of another graph. This uh, captures currently working for pay. Uh, and you can see this is uh, for 2010. And this is for China, Japan, Slovenia, Sweden, um, England, uh, and the United States. Uh, one of the things that you can see is there's some extreme variation. Uh, we've limited this here to uh, people 55 to 64, so people we might reasonably expect to be working age. You can see in Slovenia, it's less than 25% of people who are currently working. And in Sweden, uh, it's more than 75%. And these are both share countries. Um, so we know that these, uh, really the same question that was used to derive both of these is exactly the same. And so you can get an idea of some of the variation that you see um, between different countries. And, and it's a really great uh, natural place to study um, the impact of uh, policy and cultures um, between different countries. Uh, and here's an example of uh, a table um, as opposed to a graph. Uh, and this is the net value of kind of residence in the United States. And this is between 2000 and 2012. Um, and one of the things that you can see here is the, the housing crisis in the United States, um, <clears throat> where housing prices really started to fall in 2008 and have continued uh, to fall until 2012. Uh, all of the graphs and tables you can download. Uh, we just ask that you cite them. We've also built a publication search, as I mentioned. So users can find publica publications based on health and retirement studies around the world, which are relevant to their research focus. Um, I'll jump back over to our website briefly. Um, so on the publications tab, um, here, uh, you can say, for instance, I'm interested in publications uh, that use shared data, uh, and then, for instance, uh, you know, uh, have um, something about uh, cognition in the title. Um, and then for any of these, uh, we include a direct link um, or a link to Google Scholar to that paper if available. Uh, and then you're also able to export um, in TXT, CSV, or EndNote file um, any of the citations that you would like. Um, so it's a really helpful way to get started with uh, research using this family of studies and knowing what's already out there. There is some slight delay uh, in us updating this publication search, so we try to go through maybe every three or four months uh, and see what's new and been published and we add it then. Uh, and lastly, I'll just mention harmonized data files. Um, so harmonized data sets are created to provide harmonized measures of HRS type surveys. So variables are defined as similarly as possible to the RAND HRS. And the RAND HRS is this uh, easy to use, um, kind of user-friendly version of the HRS data, which is most commonly used in the United States. Um, all the data sets are combined, all waves, so each individual is one record. Uh, and then we use a simple variable naming function. So for instance, a variable named all one work is whether the respondent is currently working in wave one. We also include country-specific variable names. So for instance, a variable like R1, LBRF, or labor force, underscore C um, in the Charles data, the Chinese data set, would let you know that it captures the respondent's labor force in wave one, but it has a different response scale um, to some of the other studies. And we also include spouse versions of most variables. Uh, one of the advantages of harmonization is that we take care of accounting for some of the survey skip pattern. So here's a really uh, easy example of how we accounted for a survey skip pattern to make a variable which captures whether the respondent smokes now. Um, of course, this saves you just a small amount of time, um, but they also get uh, much more complicated, especially with the income and wealth variables, um, and particularly months of uh, programming. And if you're not interested in programming up every component of wealth or income for a family, uh, these can be really invaluable resources. Uh, for all of our harmonized code books, we include lots of documentation. So each harmonized data set is accompanied by its own code book. It includes an overview of statistics for each variable, we detail variable creation and any assumptions made in the creation. We highlight any differences between waves for this harmonized variable <coughs> and the RAND HRS harmonized variable. We always use the RAND HRS harmonized, uh, the RAND HRS variable as kind of our base point to compare um, other studies variables. And we list all variables from the originating data set using the creation. So if you kind of disagree with our assumptions about creating it, you can create it on your own. Um, here's an example of the code book from the harmonized share. So you can see we make a smoke ever variable and a smoke now variable, both for the respondent and the spouse. This is waves one through five. And of course, as Stefan mentioned, uh, wave three was um, not a panel wave. We include descriptive statistics. 
uh, you can see um, <clears throat> the tabulations. Uh, you'll also notice that we use special missing codes, which are available in SAS, SATA, and SPSS to give you more information about uh, why a value might be missing. We include lots of text about how the variable was constructed. Uh, and we mentioned differences with the RAINHRS. And then lastly, we list those shared variables which were used in the creation. Uh, currently, here are all the harmonized data files which are available. So that includes the harmonized ELSA, which is the first seven waves of ELSA. The harmonized uh, SHARE, which currently includes waves one through five of SHARE. Uh, we are working on incorporating wave six now. Harmonized JSTAR for Japan. Harmonized CLOSA for Korea. Harmonized MHAS for Mexico. Harmonized Corellos for Costa Rica. The harmonized TILDA for Ireland, of course. The harmonized Charles uh, for China. And the harmonized LASI, which currently just uh, incorporates the pilot uh, data for LASI, which was conducted in 2010 in India. And harmonized data files are either distributed through the gateway or by the originating data set. Um, <clears throat> you can find links to all of the harmonized data and other data sets uh, on the download tab. Uh, so we have links to all of the data to where you download the survey data. Um, as Stefan and Siobhan mentioned, um, usually you have to sign up with each um, data set and the data, uh, the data provider will provide that data for you. You can also download the harmonized data sets, the code book, and this data creation code which was used to create it in case you want to see exactly how these data sets were created. Uh, uh, to be able to download um, and use some of our uh, more advanced features, we do ask that you register on our site also. Uh, you say you register at g2aging.org. It's quite simple, and we'll send you a confirmation email. Great. Thank you. Uh, that was very useful. Um, okay. So, uh, questions. Um, the first one, I will um, point first of all to, to Stefan. Um, so um, someone is interested in using shared data um, for journalism. They work at a newspaper. Is there any way they can access shared data? Um, can you please repeat the end of the question? Sorry, I didn't get it. Yes, that's right. So someone who is working at a newspaper is interested in using shared data. What are the access sort of arrangements in this case? Um, well, we, we have, um, uh, well, there, there's no general answer to that. Um, when you want to apply um, for data access, um, you have to fill in um, this user statement. And if, you're not, if you don't have a scientific affiliation, there's a page two of this user statement where you to have to describe which project you want to use the data for and then we decide individually if we give data access or not so um, to the user who is interested um, just fill in the second page of the user statement and yeah um, then we decide individually okay okay and just um, following up from that another question related to someone who wanted to use data in a, a sort of master's thesis or dissertation um, is that the same advice uh, well, master's thesis and dissertation is definitely um, a scientific purpose, mm -hmm. so I do not see any problem there. Okay, great. Um, and could I put the same questions to Siobhan? Yeah, um, or data as well used by master's and PhD students. So obviously you'd be affiliated to an institution if you're completing your master's and that's the affiliation that you would use and it's widely used for that purpose. Okay. Mm -hmm. And what about um, the case for journalism? I don't currently know. I can't answer that question as to... I think it would be worth going on to the ISDA site, which mm -hmm. is the Irish housing of our data, and making an application. Okay, that's great. I, um, I'm not sure what the follow-up process is then, or whether there's more measures or that can be taken, um, or an agreement that can be made, but it's probably worth um, making an initial application. Mm -hmm. Okay, brilliant. And Dristin, do you have anything else to add about access for those two situations? Um, no, I, I just mentioned that uh, each study uh, is um, does have their own kind of um, specifications for who can apply for the data, use it, and, and how easy that is. 
Um, I will say for everything on the gateway, um, that you could absolutely use it uh, if you were um, in journalism um, or in school. Though in general, um, we don't distribute the data ourselves. So if you're interested in using the data yourself and not just maybe information about the questionnaire or what you can generate from our graphs and tables, um, then you, you will have to go to the data providers themselves. Okay, brilliant. Um, now I have a question about data management, and, and this was um, put to Siobhan. Um, and the question was, do you have any sort of observations about data management and sort of developing data management plans for studies such as TILDA, um, especially any issues around sort of preservation, especially for sensitive data? Yeah, so I touched on this in the presentation, is that we are very conscious that we don't want our data to become identifiable. And we have an ongoing data management process and a growing data management team that oversees all of this. So with the information that we released on the ISTA website, it is a much smaller version of the data set than we house internally, which is the privileged access data set, what we call it, and that, that is only for internal users. Um, we do, I suppose all I can say is that we, for each wave of data that comes in, and when we're preparing it for release to the public archive, it's gone through question by question. Every piece of information is reviewed with a view to identifying any possible um, anonymity issues. The other area where there's a risk of uh, identification and particularly in relation to sensitive information is when we, um, when we link our data to external sources such as things like the cancer registry, the death registry, etc. Uh, so in any case where we have developed linkages with other sources, they're all governed by a very stringent uh, data agreement which enforces all of the checks that we carry out internally in TILDA and you know, does everything possible to prevent anonymization. And again, the use of these would usually be restricted to a select group of people who have privileged access to the data and are governed by very strict data sharing and data use criteria. But going forward, you know, as these things evolve, I don't know what, you know, I think certainly other studies, I'm aware that ELSA in their public data set is why they, they share everything because they're not governed under their agreements. You know, they, they just share suites of data and they don't seem to have that issue. Um, but all I can say is that within TILDA we're constantly involving the data management and uh, try to be as strict as possible about sensitive information. Hopefully that answers the question. If there's any other points we want to pick up on, just let us know. Um, a next question that we have um, concerns uh, questions about geography. Um, so perhaps if, if Sean, um, Siobhan, you could answer that about access to geographic location of respondents in TILDA. That's not currently uh, available in the archive data sets. Okay, great. And what about in... Oh, sorry. No, I think we just have a general identifier, which is urban-rural. Um, divide, but we don't have the geocoded data. Uh -huh. Great, okay. And what about for share? What kind of geographic um, information is there? Well, in share, um, we have called the NAT codes, um, which are provided in one of the um, generated variable modules. I don't know if uh, people are, know these uh, NUTS codes. It's basically a hierarchical system which, which structures um, the country in, in different subsystems, geographical subsystems. And um, it actually depends on the national data protection law um, which NUTS level we allowed to, to release. Um, so, yeah, it actually depends on the country you're interested in. and. Um, but in general, um, this geographical information is available in SHARE for the time of sampling. So we do not have a constant information on that, but at the time of sampling, when the household entered SHARE, um, for this time we have uh, uh, geographical information covered by the so-called NUTS codes. Okay, 
In Gateway to Global Aging Data, what kind of geographic information is available? Um, so we don't have any information available um, uh, that's not provided by the studies themselves. So again, it just depends on the study. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Um, and I'll go with this question. So, um, so one would like to know: so the harm, does harmonize mean that the, the sort of particular data sets can be sort of merged together into one file if that was desired? Um, I think that is like um, the ideal goal. Um, of course, that's not always um, possible uh, because there are a lot of differences in um, how the surveys are set up, um, the questions that are asked, or just um, uh, the culture or the um, <clears throat> or the design of that country in particular. Uh, maybe their institutions. Um, uh, so what we what we try to provide though is a means for getting started. Um, for being able to do that comparison. And so a lot of that we do through documentation and then also the harmonized data sets. Um, and the harmonized code book, which is a part of the harmonized data sets, include lots of information about exactly how comparable all these measures are and, and how we attempted to harmonize them. I have a question specifically about SHARE. So is the household respondent in SHARE similar to the core respondent in ELSA? That is, should it be analyzed, should analysis be restricted to such respondents? Um, well, I can't say much about the, the concept of core respondent and ELSA, um, but um, for SHARE, um, we have different types of, of, of special respondents. Um, the household respondent is only one um, special respondent. We also have a so-called financial respondent who answers uh, financial questions on behalf of the couple. And additionally, we have a, a family respondent who answers, for example, questions about a couple's children on behalf of the couple. So um, I, my imagination is that it, it might be a little bit different um, this concept that uh, that Elsa has uh, with a core respondent. Um, yeah, I hope this answers the question. Can speak to that also because I'm familiar with Elsa, but Elsa does have um, particular respondents. I know they have a financial respondent and I think a family respondent um, that answer particular sets of questions. Uh, I, I assume, um, uh, Brian, maybe you're asking, um, uh, this questioner is, is asking what the correspondent is um, any individual um, uh, who's answering it. So no, there are um, particular people who are uh, asked different modules inside of ELSA as there are in SHARE. Sorry, do you have anything more to add there, Stefan? The, 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 the respondents, they are, they are not chosen by us, but we ask um, within the household, we ask who is uh, who wants to be the, the household respondent. So who is responsible for the uh, financial situation in the household? Then this respondent is the financial respondent. So um, we actually ask the respondents, um, if we interview a couple, who of both is um, responsible for the finances of the couple. So um, that's how these respondents are chosen. 